this is a very good job in this airplane, that's cool. We call it the balls of steel. <laughs> I used to live close to here, school as well. And if you're planning to come to Belgium, you might want to stop in Ghent as well. So, uh, pretty cool stuff. So, you guys have a lot of going here in Poland. You have some things too. So, uh, uh, professionally, I'm a technical evangelist at a hosting company called Comel in Belgium. Apart from that, I'm also uh, one of the board members of PHP Benelux. Who has ever heard of PHP Benelux? I would say there's still room for more. There's still potential, but we'll see about that. So, uh, if you want, and only if you want, you can follow me on Twitter. This is my Twitter handle. Uh, my full name is basically. So, uh, if you want to do some interaction with me, I would be most happy. Now, here's an important part, and I think a lot of people have been stressing this so far. There is this thing called join in. Uh, I'm not sure who, who uses joining who is who is gonna post some feedback here, some valuable feedback. Come on! <laughs> so uh, I can use that feedback, why? For two reasons. To improve this talk, so I have to do this talk next week as well. At PHP Northwest and Manchester, I wanna do a good job. I wanna do a good job for you guys as well. So if you say, well you should improve this or you should stick with that, I will do that. And it's also good for conference organizers if they're interested in inviting me again. I get it. So uh, I won't mention that much commercial stuff. This is a community conference, but I work at a hosting company. If you ever need hosting and you're interested or doing business with Belgium, get in touch with me. So Varnish. Who does not know Varnish? For who? Welcome. I hope, I hope we can learn something. Yeah. So uh, what would you call Varnish? I'm going to need some interaction here. What's Varnish to you guys? If we, if we would have to give a definition, a one word definition of Varnish, what would that be? Cash. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, <laughs> any other ideas? Whoa, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and I need the last one. What can you also do with Varnish? You can cash. It's a reverse proxy. <laughs> oh, you guys are amazing. <laughs> wow. So, uh, but Varnish itself says, yeah, we do all those sorts of things, and they want a single term for it. And they call themselves an HTTP accelerator. That's the term they're using for it. So it does everything related to PHP. Now, if I would have to explain this to people who aren't that web savvy, but I think you guys all have decent technical skills, so I'm, I'm very confident we will have an interesting uh, story today. But to a lot of people who don't understand, I explained it with this photo from the bodyguard. Who has seen the bodyguard back what was that, the 90s, with Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner? And I, then I tell, well, okay, Whitney? Whitney is your Apache server. That's Whitney. <laughs> and, uh, and Kevin? Well, Kevin, he's Varnish. So if you would have to communicate with Whitney, you would say, oh, Whitney, I'm a huge fan. Can I have your picture? You're not going to ask Whitney. You're going to ask Kevin. And Kevin's going to say, well, here is a picture. I cashed this one in my pocket. <laughs> Or he's going to say, well, okay, uh, Whitney, this is person X. Would you like to talk to him? And then she passes the information, he passes it through. So it's a sort of protection uh, mechanism. And we will keep in the comparison of Whitney and Kevin in the story. For those who get lost, eventually we will pop it up and use the Whitney and Kevin story if required. But the primary focus and the most stuff we'll do with it is caching. It's plain old caching. Reverse proxy caching in that way. So I think but that's pretty clear because you guys saw Wimstock as well, which was pretty good, right? It was good. Do you like Wimstock? Yeah. Yes, OK, good. Well, he explained the basics, so I can skip that. But using a reverse proxy isn't always that easy. Uh, there's a success and failure factor. And the success and failure mainly depends on one thing and one thing only, and that is how good you are with HTTP. A lot of people just mess about. Uh, People we call script kiddies. We are not script kiddies here. We're real developers, so let, let's, <laughs> let's be honest. And uh, they just mess about and throw sessions and cookies all over the place. But if you know what HTTP is about, and also the RESTful <coughs> things. Uh, I heard some good things. There were some guys I talked to. Who was at Symphony Live? You, got, you were? Uh, has, everyone, has anyone seen a presentation by David Zucker called uh, uh, HTTP and REST? You should definitely check that one out. So, uh, and he, he explains the fundamentals of what HTTP is about and how you can leverage this in web applications. So let's have a quick look at the way 
PHP component does it. So this is a plain old HTTP request, and you see several things that happen here, which Varnish likes and does not like. So first of all, uh, yeah, this is plain and simple. I have a cookie here, SID, session ID, with a hash, and I'm gonna put that true to the server. So the moment that one comes in, Varnish is gonna say, oh, but this is a cookie. And cookies usually do user-generated content. This is user-specific, so it might not be a good idea to cache. So we're gonna let it true. So if we use this with a standard Varnish setup, it won't cache. And it says, well, I'm not really a fan of cache control, so if it's up to me, I don't want to use browser cache. And if we get the response back, there's some interesting stuff happening as well. Well, the back end is going to do a set cookie as well, and it's going to say to, so Whitney's going to ask Kevin to say to that person in front of you, well, here's, if we, if we draw a comparison, here's my card, call me. Well, this is it. Well, this is your unique session ID. You can use it. And Varnish is going to say, well, oh shit, this is user-specific content. Let's not cache this. And that's the way HTTP actually works. It, it does some cache control here. No cache, no store, must revalidate. So Varnish will say, no, 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 no. We're not going to cache anything here. So that's success and failure here. I wouldn't call this failure. I would call it just reality because I think PHP Con Poland has a fair number of visitors. We should check the stats. But I'm pretty sure it's not going to have 20, 30,000 visitors per day. Let's be honest here. So uh, in, in that case, it, it, it's not really necessary to have hardcore caching. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So what can we cache? What can we cache? Louder. Static files. Static files. That's one. What else? Get requests, dynamic get requests, right? Yeah. From your PHP, because this is a <coughs> PHP conference, we'll solely be dealing with PHP. What else can we cache? Images. Images, yeah. The, I, I would cat categorize that under the static file name. A final one. One we often forget. Static content. We, that's the same thing, but web services. We can cache web services. If we make proper RESTful services, we can cache those as well. So, so before we go into hardcore varnish and PCL and all sorts of use cases, we have to go back to the olden days, <laughs> back in the beginning when animals could still talk <laughs> and websites were hosted on GeoCDs. Remember that time? Uh, there was browser cache. There was this thing called browser cache and personally, I didn't really like it. I was, what was I, 12, 13 years old and I said, oh, fuck that browser cache, that expiration thing. It really is messy because I want to see the news on that page and my browser is stopping me. Why was there some stupid guy who invented caching? I was 12 years old back then. I'm now 29 years old. I'm a bit wiser. Now I learned to appreciate this, but this was invented so that slow internet connections wouldn't be clogged. So it says literally, well, this expires in 2006. This is the old way of doing things. It's the expiration header. I personally prefer the cache control header which uses it in a more <laughs> relative way. Instead of saying, well, expired on that day, you can just say, well, uh, give it an hour, give it two hours. That was used in a context where internet was really slow. Today, in this hotel, internet is really slow too. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. So we can still use those cache control headers to have good images if, if we go to the cached pages. There was also another standard that really invalidates rather than uh, expiring. So it said, well, if the content has changed, then we'll empty the cache. So that's both strategies we'll continue to use. And it uses some headers. Uh, nothing really spectacular. Now, the thing we should remember from the past is that instead of arguing that browser cache is bad, it's really our friend. It's cool. Uh, I learned to appreciate it. But there is some confusion when we just apply it to the browser and that there is multiple standards. We have invalidation uh, using the e-tag, we have expiration, we have the cache control header, so uh, multiple standards. And it can be an ignored, ignored by browsers, so if I want to, I can click a couple of buttons in my Firefox and there is no caching happening. And you can actually force, force refresh as a user. Back in the day, that wasn't a problem because you only messed up your own internet connection. Now the focus has shifted more or less and we're trying to add caching to the server side or to the data center side just to avoid that their network or their servers are going to get hit. So we have a shift 
where the proxy or the caching layer moves from front to back. So in that case, forcing refresh could be cumbersome and could really mess up your situation. And of course, there's a cache per client. Now, big surprise if I would tell you you could choose Varnish to solve that issue. So uh, who has Varnish running in production here? Again, lots of potential. So let's hope after this session, you're all going to run out like crazy and even clog the network even worse than is to download that lovely piece of software. Uh, so installing it and configuring it. Now, this is a useful case because in a lot of cases, I go to places where people already know Varnish. So in this case, this might be useful. Uh, we're all in production Linux people here. Linux, OK, that is comforting, <laughs> all Linux people. What distributions do you use? OK, so I'm more of a Debian Ubuntu guy myself. So if you want to install the latest version, so version 3, you just follow those little steps. So you're going to have the GPG key. You, you're going to add it to your system. Uh, you're going to add a custom channel from their systems. You're going to update your APT or aptitude. And you're going to install it. If you don't add the first steps, you're going to just download it from the repo that comes with your distribution, which might be an older version. It might be version 2 still. I would advise you to follow these steps and go directly to version 3 because it has improved somewhat. Now, if you have installed it, there's going to be a file called varnish in your etc default. And that really summarizes all the daemon options. It's pretty clear on the slide as well that there are a bunch of daemon options we should respect. The first one being the port and the IP it should listen on. So you see the colon. I have not added an IP address, so it will claim all IP space available on port 80. <coughs> Now, for if you already have a system in production and you want to start testing it, I would advise you to take another port. Otherwise, it's going to claim your HTTP port and your website will be down. So for starters, you could add 8080 as the port. And once you progress and you feel that you are ready to go into production, you might want to change this to 80. This is also a cool one. This is the minus T. This is the Telnet interface. So if you are on the local host and you go to 6082, you'll be able to Telnet in and do some management. I will show you in a minute. This is where all the magic happens. This is the file that contains all the rules. And to skip ahead just a bit, Varnish comes with VCL, Varnish Configuration Language. And it's a sort of scripting language with curly bracket style, very similar to PHP and C and Perl, in which you can actually program your cache to follow certain amounts of rules. This is security. This contains a secret key required to authenticate on the talent interface. So you don't want anyone that doesn't have access to just start randomly restarting your Varnish config. And in the end, you're going to have to choose some storage. This is storage. In Varnish 2, if you use Debian's and Ubuntu's, maybe a bit older versions, you're going to get file here. So it's going to store everything to file. File is slower than memory. We all know that. So what I did here was add 256 megabytes of RAM on my small little box to Varnish. So that's basic setup. Once you've set this up, we still know Kevin and Whitney, right? Kevin needs to be able to talk to Whitney. So in that case, we're going to have to set up the back end. The back end is just a basic proxy strategy. What you do, I still use Apache in this example. A lot of people already use Nginx. For Nginx, it's as simple as well. You just save your or change your basic server config. In this case, if you use an apt get install on Ubuntu or Debian of Apache, just go edc apache2ports.conf, and you change your port from uh, 80 to 8080 or to every other port you want to choose. I use 8080 as a standard because it's easy to memorize. Once you've done that, your Apache is no longer, of course, you have to change your vhost settings as well. That's an important one. But once you've done this, your Apache is no longer running on 80. Your Apache server is now Whitney. And we're going to make sure our varnish is kept. So in that case, we have to make sure there's some sense of communication. And in that VCL file, so EDC varnish default VCL, you are going to mention the backend. And your default backend is big surprise named default. And you are going to mention how you can connect. So that's essentials. Once you set that up, the default varnish rules will be followed. So we're talking out of the box behavior. And what is the out of the box behavior? Well, there's a bunch of rules that need to be followed. And Wim touched on that uh, earlier. But what he, he did that as well. But what I'm willing to focus more on is <laughs> Default behavior versus custom behavior. Because as mentioned, you have a scripting language. You can change everything you want. But out of the box, this stuff will happen. Only get and head requests are cached. Why is that? Anyone? Yes, why? 
Indeed, indeed. So that's the perfect definition. You should be doing this talk. You should, you should come <laughs> up here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he's absolutely right. Post and delete, or put for that matter, change application state. So if things change, you're not going to cache it. You just want to clear your cache at that time. So only get and head requests will be cached. Then we're digging into the entire cookie debate. If a cookie occurs, or a set cookie, so those are two different things. Uh, I will explain that in a minute. Vartners will say, oh, user-specific content, let's not touch this. I explained this in the beginning. If the cache TTL is larger than zero, it will cache as well. If it's lower, it will say, oh, well, this application does not want to be cached, let's not cache it. And if there's a very asterisk header, uh, it won't cache either. Now, I need to touch the cookie thing, because cookies are so important and they're a big mess. I spend a lot of my time integrating Varnish on existing sites. So people come up with a project, it fails in production, and they say, we need this faster. This, this needs to be way faster. So I start digging into their code and looking how do they uh, expose their URLs, how they expose their cookies. And cookies are always a mess. And people always confuse that there are two parts of cookies, two kinds of cookies. So you have the regular cookies, that is the state stored in your browser. And then you have the server requesting to change that state. So initially, if you've never been to a website and you go to it the first time, and the server wants to keep some sort of state, it will do a set cookie in the response. So you get the response back from the server, and you will see that there's a set cookie requested by the system. You will store that in your browser. Upon the next request, a regular cookie header is going to be set with the value. So it says, well, dear server, uh, it's the second time or the third time I visit you. I have some cookie data here. Can you use this? And these are quite conflicting, but in both <laughs> cases, Varnish will say, can't touch it. <laughs> then the next question, how will Varnish cache? So once you decided that something is cacheable, because that's an important one, you have, you have two kinds of things that are not in cache, either because it has not been hit before or because it's theoretically in cacheable. And the theoretically in cacheable, that's pretty much this. So it will inspect it and it will say, oh no, I don't have it in cache, why? Because it's in cacheable. But once it's cacheable, it will make some sort of hash. Uh, it needs to be stored in the system, in RAM, in file, whatever, and it will build a hash. And the hash will be built on top of the host name and will be built on top of the URL. So if you combine both, it will have a unique string and that unique string will be the key of your hash and in that way it will be cached. Now I have a important diagram, you shouldn't if you can, memorize it. If not, just have a really close look at it. This is the basic flow, how Varnish actually works. So, uh, request comes in. So that's, uh, fan talks, wants to talk to Whitney. Kevin steps in and says, can I help you? <laughs> and the uh, can I help you part is the VCL receive. Now these are not just clever names, these are actually hooks you can program in the logic. We'll see that in the second part of the talk. So what happens there is Varnish receives it and says, yes, can I help you? Request comes in and then it gets analyzed. Analyzed if it's cacheable or not, and then how it should deal with it. <coughs> if it is cacheable, so if there's no cookies involved in any way, or cache control header is not lower than whatever, it will say, well, let's make a hash. That's based on host name, URL. Once we've dealt with that, it will check, is it in my cache? Yes or no? Is it a hit? Is it a miss? Whatever. If it's in cache, it will generate a hit. If it's not in cache, it will miss and go to the back end. Now, if something is not cacheable, well, we'll go to the back end anyway. If it's not cacheable, we'll constantly go to the back end. This is Whitney, and we'll ask Whitney, okay, I need some stuff from you, and she's gonna reply. How is she gonna reply? She is going to, the back end is gonna talk back to, uh, to Varnish, and Varnish will deliver it back in an HTTP request. Now, from start to end, this is regular HTTP, so your browser is going to think, yeah, I'm talking with a web server here. It's not really, I can't see in the signature that it's an Apache or an Nginx or an IIS, but at least we're talking to someone that understands HTTP. The entire process is abstracted from there, but keep this in mind. This is the flow we're going to follow. And I was talking about success and about failure. In that case, well, to success and failure, how can you measure that? Because how do you know something is a success or something is a failure? When you go to a website, how do you know if it's cached or not? Usually you don't. Why? Because that is abstracted. 
People building websites, building applications, don't really want you to know if something is cached or not. They don't want to bother you with that kind of stuff. But still for us, for developers, for sysadmins, for DevOps people, it is very important to know. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some basic monitoring and some basic logging. And Varnish comes with an entire stack of tools you can use for that. Let's start with Varnish stat. So that's a pretty, pretty basic tool that just shows you general real-time stats. I'm going to show you here. This is some basic stuff. <coughs> there are three measurements. You, you can compare this to top on Linux a bit. So the last 10 seconds, the average hit rate was 80, let's call it 85%. So 85% of everything coming in was hit on the cache, which is good. During the last 100 seconds, it was 76. And during the last 254, because that really shows you I've been running this shell for 254 seconds, it was 72%. So that is a, I would call that a good hit rate. And then you can dig down deeper in the stats uh, about failure, about how you can connect to the backend, about misses, about hits, about RAM use. So this is a useful tool to have a general, general view on the state of your Varnish uh, instance. So use it if you want to know. I use this all the time for my customers. I had a, a big customer integrating Varnish uh, in favor of a CDN, and he wanted to know, well, is it running well? Are we doing good? I showed him this tool, and now he can measure it for himself. This is general. We can dig deeper, and we have a tool called Varnish Log. Now, again, these are binaries that come installed by default when you apt get it. So when you install it, these binaries will be there. You can compare it to Apache or Nginx access logs, but with that difference that they're not stored physically on disk. They iterate through RAM, so they come in, they go out. And you can, capture this, you can capture this buffer where it all comes in and out, and you can see what actually happens in detail. And it's tag-based, so it's, it's kind of complicated, but I'll show you examples. Now, before I show you that example, these are headers that you're going to see. And they make sense somewhat. A request has ended, a request has started. Pretty logic. A hit, we can hit from RAM. There's an error. This is VCL call, so we're going to dig into the rule set and see what happens. We're going to return something. There is an ACL, an access list, whether or not you can access or not access it. This is cool. This is TX, stands for a transmission. So if you're transmitting to the client, so if Kevin talks to the stalky fan, uh, that's transmission. Or if Kevin talks to Whitney, that's transmission as well. RX is everything that is received. So you can filter incoming stuff, outgoing stuff. And you can filter what's going to the back end and what's, what's not. So you have a detailed way of doing this. Now, let's not keep you confused anymore. Let's show you some details how you can do this. These are a couple of examples. So you call varnish log, and you say minus C. And C implies client-side connections. So this means only connect or only store or filter out requests that actually interact with the client. So in that way, you can see what's actually coming in. <laughs> minus M is a filter, so we all only want to know all the hits. So everything that is hit, and we grab the URL. And that's going to give us all the URLs of all the hits. And th that way you can see, okay, this URL is a hit, that's a hit, that's a hit. I showed you the tags, so you can fill in whatever tag you want. So you can do detailed filtering on everything that's coming in. <laughs> you can also trigger the misses, so that you know, okay, this is... This needs improvement, because in, in reality, you want to keep your hit rate as high as possible. So in that case, you're just going to filter out what's missing and try to optimize that. Varnish Lock also has an option of storing things, writing things to disk. So these will be binary logs you can use for later purposes. Minus A for append, minus W for write. And if you want to, you can read them again, minus R. And a final example, but you can find all that stuff on the internet. There's so much, uh, there's an entire wiki on the varnish-cache.org page showing you tons of examples of VCL, so, uh, or, 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 or these kind of things. And in the end, this is the last one. You can filter out only the headers where they match cookie. So this will display just cookies for you, so you know which cookies are coming in. So I think the main thing you should remember from, these, from this slide is there are tools out there. The tool you can use for details is called Varnish Log. You can filter it out, and you can split out backend connections to regular client connections. And this is one of those. This is a general one. And you can see it has a sequ sequence number, so you can easily track which request that is. You can see that you're opening a session to this IP on port 8080, and it's a get request of test.php. 
What you also can see is that the host on which this is done is varnish.dev on port 8080. So that was a local test box. The request comes in, it comes with an entire stack of headers, even a cookie. And what you see is that we receive it and it's not in cache and it passes. Why? Because it's not really cacheable because it contains a cookie. So it's very, very, very detailed. So if you really want to know the things, you just open your varnish log. Now, if you have huge traffic site, it's not going to be interesting to open varnish log because the chars are going to flow so quickly, you're going to get drunk by looking at the screen. So you might want to save it or filter it out. Similar to varnish log, there's also a tool called varnish top. And varnish top is similar to top on Linux. It shows you varnish logs, but in an incremental way. It is tag based in the same way. It uses the same parameters. And you can like, get the top user agents out of there in real time. You can get all the top requests. You can get the top hosts uh, you connect to. You can get the top cookies. So this is just a basic way. I just filtered out the user agent. So on this thing, the top user agent is a Mozilla 5.0 Windows and E, whatever. So uh, you can get some valuable stats in there. This is an interesting one, Varnish NCSA. Now, the biggest problem when you start hitting Varnish a lot is that the access logs in your backend system, be it Apache, be it Nginx or IIS, are not going to store user information anymore. Your access logs are going to remain not really empty, but they're not going to be filled up as much. Now, if you use this, if you use log analyzing tools, such as AW stats or other tools, you're going to run into trouble because you're your stats are going to be skewed as hell. So uh, what you might want to do is launch a Varnish NCSA daemon that stores all the information in regular access log format. So this is an example. You demonize Varnish NCSA, you make sure all lines are appended and written to a file. And this is just Apache format. So if you still require this for some tool, for monitoring, for logging, for analytics, it's good. But in reality, a lot of people use Google Analytics, so this is not that commonly used. But if you have infrastructure or a setup that requires it, this is the way to go. So we covered the basic demons now for monitoring. Let's go one step further and do some telnet management. It's not SSH, so it's not secure. It's just regular telnet. And you can connect to 6082, and it will say, well, hello, welcome. And you can do all sorts of stuff. S stuff I usually do is VCL related. So let's say you have a configuration up that caches some aspects of your uh, application. And then you notice, oh, there's a bug in here, or we need to optimize something. You're not going to take that varnish out of production or bypass it. Because if you do that, your backend is going to get hammered or go down immediately. So what you can do is prepare a VCL, a, a sort of setup, and load it. And you can do load, use, discard, list, show. So in that way, you can dynamically change your varnish configuration on the fly. Load it. If it contains a syntax error, it will tell you so, and it won't break the system. And only if it's well compiled, you can use it. So you load a file name, a VCL. You give it a name, a given name, and then you use it to load, discard. And uh, you can list and show if you want to as well. You can do other stuff as well. You can do uh, some stats. You can restart your instance. You, there, there's a ton of stuff you can do. So, but I would mainly advise you to use it if you want to uh, specifically load or reload your Varnish instance. So that's part one of the presentation. This presentation is called Varnish in Action. So I'm pretty sure we're ready for action right now. So uh, <laughs> I'm hearing some giggles. Has anyone seen this movie already? I, so when the guys picked me up from the airport, there was this huge banner of the Expendables, but in Polish. So and I claimed I understood it. I said, hey, that's the Expendables. So how do you call this stuff in Polish, the Expendables? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't reproduce it, but uh, maybe tonight in the bar, you can help me out. You can help me out. Uh, I have a Polish guy at work, so I really want to show off with my Polish skills. <laughs> Remember this one? Remember this one? This is going to be important right here, right now. Because I showed you how Varnish works, and I told you the, about these clever names and the fact that you can hook into them, and you can actually change their behavior. Well, let's do it. Because remember, out of the box, Varnish has a certain set of rules to follow. And the cool thing is if you install Varnish by default and you open your default.vcl, the entire way that Varnish behaves is documented in code. It's all commented, but in the C code, and if you would reproduce this in VCL, it would look a bit like this. So uh, if you feel geeky right now, you might want to let have a look at this code. So this is the receiving bit. And what does the receiving bit do? Well, it just takes the connection, takes the HTTP package from the client and says, OK, let's do something with this. 
it, it works at restarts, so if you're not feeling comfortable with what's coming in, you can retry and it will, re, it will grab the information in again. Well, if there are no restarts and there is an X forwarded for header, you're going to add the client IP to the X forwarded for header. So if there is communication with the backend, the backend at least knows who the original client was, which is important because in a lot of cases you do logging of IPs for abuse purposes and you always get the same IP, the IP from the varnish server which is not really useful. So you can fiddle around. Th again, this is not my invention. I did not write this code. This is what Varnish serves you out of the box. This is also useful if it's not a get, not a head, not a put, not a post, not a trace, not options, not delete. So not anything we know of. We're going to just say, well, it's not an RF RFC. We're just going to pipe. What pipe means is just find a sideway, a sort of bypass route to directly connect and offload your stuff to the server and say, well, I don't want to deal with this. I don't know what this is, so you just do whatever you do. It's like Kevin taking a coffee breaker. So it's like, you deal with this. I don't want it. Then, very logical. Uh, you mentioned application state. Well, this is it. If it's not a get and it's not a head, well, we only deal with get and head, pass. Now, these are useful words. Pipe means bypass. Pass is actually, well, let's give the backend a chance to respond to this and let's reinterpret that. So if we go to this slide, Pass is go directly to the backend, uh, or, 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 uh, or pipe is directly to the backend. Pass is when the system receives it and says, well, let's talk to Varnish and maybe it will come back. And if there is an authorization header or a cookie, and this is where the cookie magic happens, if there is a cookie, well, I don't feel like caching it. We're going to send it to the backend, the backend is going to deal with it. In every other case, we're going to look it up. We're going to look up the key in the cache and see if it's in there. This is the receiving bit. There's more. There's more than just receiving. We can also hash. And this is where the hashing magic happens. So it hashes your URL by default. But if your Varnish setup is specifically tailored around multiple host names, you're going to run into trouble because the home page for your multiple hosts will be stored in one key that will add to the confusion. So what we're going to do, if there is a host, we're going to also hash the host in there. So I have a specific one host URL. If you're not using a host but an IP address, then it's just a server IP that's in there. And it's going to return the hash. So that is the way hashing happens. If you want to optimize or change hashing behavior, which I will show in a minute, you will need to change this one. If, at a given point in time, you want to connect to the backend, so Kevin talks to Whitney, right? We're still, still clear on this. It will check if BRESP, so that means backend response, so that's actually the response from Apache, IIS, Nginx, if it is lower or equal than zero, or the system has requested a cookie, or there is a vary header with an asterisk, we'll store it in cache, but not a regular cache, but a sort of blacklist cache, sort of blacklist, so that if the next request come in, comes in, we don't have to go to the backend, we immediately know, okay, let's not cache this, this, we shouldn't cache this. So this is the hit for pass cache, and it will be stored in there for 120 seconds. So even if you change your backend, settings and you remove the cookie or you have better TTL, the system will still say, well, the next 120 seconds, we're not going to hit anything. And in all other cases, we'll just deliver. We'll deliver it to the client. What will we deliver? What we have fetched from the backend. So this is default behavior. We're all on the same page here. Do we understand? Yes? No? Maybe? Sleeping? Not interested? <laughs> okay, thanks. But that's default behavior. And I think in 90 Let's throw a number on it. On, in 95% of all cases, your default VCL won't be good enough because you have specific application logic that doesn't really comply to those rules. So we're going to have to construct our own little VCL. And this is, if, you're, if, you, if you are a coder or a developer, you're especially going to like this. I, I'm not really a professional developer, but I do a lot of development and I always like tweaking these things. Now, what you might want to do is just say, well, everything that is static, and how do you identify something static based on the extension? If the URL is a get and a head, and the URL ends, this is regular expressions. We all know regex, right? Regex, we master it. Great. If it ends with PNG, GIF, GPEG, or GPG, SWF, CSS, JS, HTML, or HTML, or SSTM, you can add whatever you want in the back of it. We're just going to look it up from cache. If it's different, well, we're going to pass it to the back end. So this really caches static images or static files whatsoever. So that's a good one. And you should implement that one. If your uh, images get served with a set cookie header, you could just say, well, whatever. We're just going to cache it. 
this is what I do in a lot of cases, even in production. How do you know as a developer or as a system administrator that the request you're pulling in <coughs> is a hit or a miss? Well, you can do that easily. In the delivering part, that's the final part, the part before the data returns to the client, you can add a custom header. So what I do is if the object, which is stored in cache, has more than zero hits, well, we're clearly dealing with something that is hit from the cache. So we add a custom header, x varnish cache is a hit. In all other cases, it's a miss. So that's a good one, and I use it all the time. I use Firebug in my Firefox, and then I check the headers, and then I see, okay, hit, miss, how many times was it hit? That's really easy for the client also to, to, to check. Use it if you'd like to. Now we have to talk TTLs, we have to talk expiration. By default, there's a set of rules to be followed. I'll show you in the next slide. But if you want to override the default time to live of a caching object, you can set it. You can set backend response.ttl is 10 seconds for everything that starts with blah. Blah one, blah two, it's all going to be cached for 10 seconds. In all other cases, it's an hour. So you really can do some specific stuff, especially when your cache control strategy isn't that solid and you don't get the right cache control headers back. You can explicitly say, well, it should be cached for that long. But there is a set of, there's an order, an actual order we should follow. So if you set your bresp.ttl in your Varnish VCL script, it's going to follow that. It's going to uh, obey that and only that. If there is no bresp.ttl, it's going to go and look for a cache control header from the back, but the smaxh. Anyone knows what smaxh is? smaxh is a property in the cache control spectrum of headers that is specifically designed for proxies. Now, the regular cache control header is going to add max h, but if there is an x s max h specifically designed in the HTTP spec for that, it's going to prefer that one. So if you want to, you can set a cache control strategy that differs for browsers and for your proxy. So you could say, well, 10 seconds for the other one and um, 20 seconds for your browser in that case. And that way, you can save some bandwidth connecting to Varnish 2. If neither of those are set, it's just going to look for an absolute expire header. So that's the logical order of things. So it's interesting that you know how Varnish deals with that kind of stuff. Now we're going to deal with cookies, and that's always a mess. It gave me multiple headaches. Uh, it's, it's a, I hate cookies. And we should find another way to deal with state. Maybe there will be an HTTP 2.x standard in a number of years that will say, well, let's ban cookies. And I would really support that stuff. If we could find another way to keep track of state or identify users, that would be really nice. So in the receiving bit, we can just say, well, if there is a cookie, just remove it. Uh, yeah, that, that could work. Uh, like if you know the only cookies you have are Google Analytics cookies, just remove them. You don't need them. Because these ones are going to block the cacheability. These will have a great and huge impact on your hit miss rate. You can also remove server cookies. Naturally, that happens in the fetching bit. So this is receiving, talking to the client, making sure the client does not send a cookie to your varnish. And this is prohibiting that set cookie headers interfere. This is how you do it for Google Analytics. If you have multiple cookies, let's say you have an admin panel and it comes with a PHP session ID, that means you are an admin, it's user-specific content, you're not going to caching it. You're not going to go around caching it. But if there's a Google Analytics cookie, you're just going to say, well, maybe we don't really need this. And I spent a lot of time <coughs> figuring that one out, which was kind of stupid. So in the beginning, I said, well, if we remove Google Analytics cookies, then the stats will be skewed. But that's not really the case, because Google Analytics cookies are never interpreted by the server. And always by that little chunk of JavaScript you load in your request. So you can just say, well, uh, if there is a cookie, we're going to replace everything that starts with underscore UTM and then a char, because that's the way Google Analytics works. It's still some legacy from the urchin times, because Google Analytics is just an acquisition of urchin with some extra stuff on it. So that's why UTM is still in there. If it's UTM and it can, doesn't really contain a semicolon, this means this is still data from Google Analytics. Just remove it by one, so everything else. So what you're going to do is going to do some regular expression subtraction magic, and you're just going to get the cookie out and keep the rest. If that would be your only cookie, if there is no data left, well, just remove the cookie. So in that case, you're quite flexible. You can also ignore cookies and just say, well, even if there's a cookie, we're just going to return it from cache. That might be dangerous if you're working with sessions, because in that case, the session data that will be exposed to you will be the one of the first hit. And we had that one in production. We had a not so smart engineer who changed that once on a setting. And it was with a shopping page. And it said, welcome, 
some guy's name to another guy's name. So that wasn't so good. <coughs> Client wasn't so happy about this. So we, what we learned the hard way, unfortunately, is only do this if you're absolutely 100% sure it's not going to interfere with your application logic. Now another thing I do <coughs> on a weekly basis these days is instead of ignoring cookies or throwing cookies out, working with cookies, making sure cookies are part of the hash. The good thing is you're going to increase your cacheability. The bad thing is you're going to have some specific cache keys for specific users. So you're going to have a cache key per user. So what you can do is say, well, let's just look it up. And we're going to make sure that all cookies, so the entire cookie string with all the cookies separated by a semicolon will be stored as a hash. So that will make sure that user-specific content will be cached, but in a separate cache key per user. What I do in a lot of cases is, and that's even another use case, is only work with specific cookies for the hash. So in a lot of cases, imagine you have a website, a multilingual website, and you don't want to expose the language in the URL. So in a lot of cases, it's slash en or slash pl. I think it's even the case on the phpcon.pl website. You have Polish content, you have English content. That is nicely structured in the URL, but not everyone wants to do that. In a lot of websites, you just land on the landing page and you have to select your language and you have to remember it and it will be stored in a cookie. Upon the next hit, it will be smart enough to get the right data. But if you cache all of that stuff and let's say a Polish guy visits a website in Polish and it stores it in cache and the English guy comes on the website, he'll see Polish content. So that's not really something we'd like. So what we could do is look for a country cookie, let's, let's call it country, and find the actual value of the country and store that in a cookie. So you can have Dutch content, English content, Polish content, French content, whatever. But you're going to have separate cache keys for that. And regardless of the URL pattern, you're going to have the right data to serve to the right person. So that's a useful one. That's a really useful one. So uh, let's stop talking about caching for a minute. I told you that Varnish is more than just a cache. It does. It works well with backend, so it's a good proxy in a whole. And uh, as a whole, I mean. And uh, it's also a good load balancer. So it works with backend, so we only showcase the default backend, but you can add multiple backends. You can say, well, we have a server here, we have a server there, and we have another server uh, at, at, at some other place. And we all want to connect them to that single Varnish instance and create some interesting logic in which it distributes its, uh, its loads, its requests to the different one. So uh, let's say Whitney's sister and mother-in-law are also going out for the night, and there's only Kevin to protect them. Well, he can specify how he communicates or how he protects each backend. So what you could do is say, well, if the request host is for dub, 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 well, then we go to your default backend. And for all other requests, we can say, let's go to the other backend. And you can do, like, this is very flexible. You can even base it on cookies, on headers, or whatever. But you are flexible enough to choose another backend at runtime, which is cool, which is very cool. And you can apply that to load balancing. Let's, call, let's say this is our default backend. You see I've added a bunch of details. This is a probe. And this will probe certain content to see if it's healthy because you don't want to serve data for a server that's gone down. So in that case, you're going to check, is the slash healthy? And you're going to specify some timeouts. If these timeouts have expired, in that case, you're dealing with an unhealthy backend, and you're just going to skip to the next one. And then we have another one. These are two backends. And these backends, you can group them if you want to in something we call a director. A director behaves like a backend, but can have multiple backends. So you register those backends, and then you're going to mention 10 minutes, Darius? OK, thanks. So we still have 10 minutes to finish this stuff. It will definitely work out. So uh, you can specify strategies on how to switch between uh, several backends. This is random. You can have round robin. You have, you have all sorts. I will show you. And then you just connect to it. If one of those backends goes down, Varnish is intelligent enough to notice this and will trigger another one. So in that way, you can actually do load balancing without caching if you want to. So these are the directors that are present. You have round robin, so 50-50, or if there's three, 33, 33, 33. You can do random, you can do hashing, so you can specify the URL and see, make a hash out of it and cache it on, on, on or, or direct it to several nodes. You can use DNS for it. You can, uh, the, these are stickies. Uh, this is very sticky, so what you can do is say, well, if this request comes in from that user, we want that user to go to that backend. So in that case, it would work. Uh, this is specifically useful if you don't use memcached to distribute your PHP sessions, if you're still loading them on disk, you want to make sure that the next request from that user, especially, especially well, let's say you have an, uh, an online shop and you want to sell some stuff, and he puts stuff in the shopping cart, and the next hit comes in and he drops it to another backend, well, he loses all information. 
So in that case, you might want to use those. Uh, and then you have a fallback one, so you can stack them on top of each other. If one fails, he'll just try another one. So this is it. Another thing that is particularly interesting is grace mode. So grace mode allows you to keep reading from cache, so surf old content, even if the backend is down. Why should we use that? Well, we hate to surf in cache HTTP 500 internal server error. That is not something particularly interesting. So this grace mode saved my ass a lot of times. And I really like it. So you should use it if you want to. And you can say, well, if the backend is healthy, we're just going to surf uh, stale content for one second. Otherwise, we're going to serve it for 10 seconds. We talked about, like, when we talked about how to empty your cache or modify your cache by rewriting your stuff to memcached. Well, this is a similar pattern we're going to use in Varnish. What we are going to do is actually say, well, we're going to implement a purging strategy. So if you call, you, you're all Linux PHP people, so you all know curl, right? Curl? Yes? OK, great. So if you're going to request that URL, you're going to add a custom method called perch, or whatever you want to call it. You can call it A, B, C, X, Y, Z if you want to, as long as you stick to it in your varnish configuration. And then the system will know, well, the person requesting this actually wants to clear this out of the cache, which can be kind of useful because you're going to have, let's say, an hour TTL on your object, and then there's some breaking news coming in. You can't wait for an hour. You want this published directly. Well, you're going to actively purge that. So how are you going to do this? You're going to say, well, if the request is purged, and the client is in my perch ACL, so if that's a 192.0.2.1, et cetera, subnet, then this person is allowed to, cache, uh, to, to clear the cache because you don't want to expose that externally without an ACL. Otherwise, <laughs> smart asses like me, <laughs> we're just going to do perch on your site and then just DDoS the shit out of your system. So it's not a good idea. You, you might want to add a purging strategy. And if that person requesting the perch does not comply to the access list, it'll just say error, you are not allowed. In all other cases, it will look it up. It will go to the back or to the to the system to the hit or miss uh, pieces, and it will just empty it. So if the request is a purge, we're going to purge it. Error purged. If not, if it was a miss, well, either way, you can add a 404 here, which would be the logical choice. No. No, because we skipped, we went through that part. So I showed you all the code that was commented out nicely. That's default behavior. If you want purging, you need to code this manually. But there's plenty of examples to find on the Varnish side. My slides will be published afterwards. There's tons of people doing these, these scripting stuff. And on Drupal, WordPress, even Magento, there are modules that integrate this and that come with a piece of VCL. So you don't really have to write it yourself. It, I think on GitHub there's tons of stuff as well. So you can find some really useful cases on how to implement a nice purging strategy. Now remember, if you're combining this with regu regular varnish logic, don't make sure it checks your get, post, put, because it's going to say perch. I don't know perch, and it's just going to pipe it back. So make sure you do this before you actually start working into it and exit. Because if you, if you don't exit right here, it will, everything you don't specify and you don't exit, it will just fall back on the default behavior. So uh, make sure you do this. And I think it was two days ago, I had to modify these slides because I learned something rather interesting. If you add a cookie to your hash, you can't perch. I know, shocker. It's <laughs> and that was, was pretty messed up. Why? Because the purging strategy knows the URL and the host and it's going to try to find that key in your cache. It's going to try to swipe it. But if there is a cookie added, it won't find that key. So you can't purge it. I tested it. We had this customer saying, well, I want to purge it, but nothing happens. So I wrote a piece of PHP that just displayed the current time. And it didn't change. And I requested a purge. And it said, OK, it's purged. And nothing happened. So and that's because this logic is followed. And if you add a cookie, let's say you add a country cookie, it's going to be messed up. So what you're going to use is a new strategy <coughs> called banning. And you're going to work with a regular expression. So if it's a purge you want to do, you're going to ban and you're going to make sure the object's request URL somewhat matches. So a tilde is actually a regular expression, matches somewhat the URL, and the host is exactly that. And in that way, if you use cookies, you'll be able to empty your cache in a very specific way. Keep note of it, or, 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 or write it down, or, or look at those slides when you uh, have that situation because it was really messed up. And it was only two days ago I figured this out. So uh, 
This is part two of the presentation. I have a short snippet that will only last five minutes and I will ask you kindly if you want more action. And if you want more action, I will show you. Unfortunately, 90% has already been covered by WIMP, but it's, it's a good recap. So uh, we're gonna talk about ESI for a minute and we can do this quite quickly because you know what it is. So we don't need to discuss this anymore. You know that there are several blocks on your website and uh, this is some stupid, really stupid PHP code, but it does the trick if you wanna load those things separately in a regular way, you can just include the header, you can include the footer, the main, etc., etc. But then you can't cache the several blocks, so big surprise, we're gonna introduce ESI, we're gonna add some tags, blah, 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 etc., etc. So that much we know. But in certain cases, uh, you want to make sure this goes automatically, because Wim taught us that you can do ESI tags. But that's not always so flexible because the, otherwise you have to report in your varnish VCL all the URLs that are gonna do uh, ESI, which could be a mess. But there is a strategy, I think it's also included in the Symfony 2 spectrum, surrogate capability, surrogate control. What you can do is create a helper function. This is just plain old PHP, in which you're gonna load a file and it's gonna check if it can ESI it or if it's just going to have to include it. So, if there is no surrogate capability, if the server says, I'm not really sure if I can support ESI, you're not gonna take any risks, you're just gonna include that file. If the server says, and the server with that I mean our dear friend Kevin, the Varnish server is gonna say, well, I have surrogate capabilities. I can change these ESI tags into valid HTML. And then you match if that surrogate capability header <coughs> contains ESI 1.0. If it does contain that, you're pretty sure that this is uh, a proxy that understands ESI because you're not sure you're gonna deal with varnish. You can deal with some CDN that supports ESI because as we mentioned, ESI was invented by Akamai. So if you use an Akamai CDN, you could well use this. And you're gonna reply to the system because the system is gonna do some ESI, but you're gonna reply and say, well, you say you support ESI. Well, I understand ESI myself. You're gonna say, well, I have surrogate control. I can control the ESI tags, and I understand ESI quite well. And in that case, you're just gonna build up that URL based on the file name, and you're gonna include it in a tag, you're gonna return it. And in that way, you can just do echo ESI, and it will do include where it could not do ESI, and if it can do ESI, it will generate that tag. But then you need to configure your varnish in order to be able to communicate with that, and that goes pretty simple. You just add an extra cu custom header. You say, well, if the request has to be sent to the backend, you just say, I have surrogate capability, and uh, the key is ESI 1.0. And then it will connect to the backend, and if the backend response has surrogate control, as I showed you in my script, it will say, okay, so this guy understands ESI, I understand ESI, do ESI, true. Let's parse this stuff. And we're gonna remove the header, the surrogate control header, because you don't wanna expose that to your user. That's an internal mechanism. And in that way, you can do some easy ESI. So that is something that you didn't touch. And so I'm lucky to have some additional content you can use. And this is very flexible, because if you don't work with these headers, what you're mainly doing is specifically specifying each and every URL where you wanna do ESI for. And that's gonna be a mess in the future that is not sustainable. So if you can work with these headers, and I know Symfony does, and by consequence, Silex too, uh, it's an easy way of making sure all the blocks are cacheable. And I think if you use the Silex or uh, Symfony built-in reverse proxy, you can mimic varnish behavior without actually having a varnish system at hand. So uh, it's, I'm, I'm very happy to see that these frameworks are evolving as well and thinking about the problems of the 21st century. And the problems of the 21st century are not browser cache, but server cache. And I think this adds to the story. So, uh, I think we've reached the end of this talk. I would like to thank you so much for being here. It's cool being in Poland. I've been in Poland in April for four developers. Who was there at four developers? Anyone see my talk there? Nice, thanks. Thanks for showing up. So I have feedback again. Please, if you're too lazy to go to the URL, take a picture of this uh, QR code and give me feedback, good and bad. I appreciate bad feedback as well, as long as you say what I have to improve. Don't say, it sucked. Can't help me with that. Uh, and I have to be community commercial at some point in time. Michelangelo is gonna do that, so if you forget, go to his talk as well. I'm organizing a conference together with Michelangelo and a bunch of other guys in Antwerp. It's gonna be really cool. Uh, we're gonna have some good speakers based on the CFP we've seen. If you want to be a speaker at our conference, you can, but you have to submit before Monday. So uh, I know the network can be totally fucked up here, but still, try it. 
Uh, try to submit your papers if you have some interesting stuff to say. We would love to have you. It's January 25th and 26th, so the start of next year. It's in Antwerp, Belgium. This is the URL. This is our Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, there'll be lots of Belgian beer, Belgian fries, <laughs> chocolate. We have a bowling alley. We're going to have some kick-ass speakers. And last year, we had an outdoor winter barbecue. So. Uh, <laughs> Maybe uh, tell something about the uh, costs of the PHP Benoit. Mike, well, what did we charge? I think uh, oh, we, still have to, uh, we still have to decide, but uh, two beers. <laughs> 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 no, the cost I think will be early bird for the conference only 100 something euro, yeah. not zloty euro. Uh, Just the same? <laughs> Just the same like you? I guess so, uh, but there's a, so we also have tutorial day on Friday, in which like last year we had Fabien from Symphony, we had Matthew Wirofini from Zend, we had some guys talking about the HTML5, about mobile development, and we're pretty sure we're gonna have a kick-ass uh, tutorial day as well. So with that, it, will, it could ramp up uh, non-early bird rates up to 200 something euro, but uh, we'll communicate those numbers once they come in, because we wanna keep it as cheap as possible, so we depend on good sponsors, but I'm pretty sure it will be affordable for what you get in return. And it's going to be a great experience, I assure you that. Okay. So, so do we have time for questions or do we have uh, lunch now? No, we are on the lunch time now. Uh, so we must um, ask the questions uh, after the yeah, that's okay. uh, speech. Because we're all hungry, I right? I suppose and maybe speech. at uh, barbecue evening. Yeah, you, uh, if you have some specific questions, don't mind showing up. I'll be here until tomorrow morning, so uh, I wouldn't mind talking to, to you guys. It's been a pleasure, so thank you for having me. It was really cool being here, and uh, enjoy lunch. Thank you. Thank you.